Welcome to Optimizing GIST Treatment. Please remember that information provided in this web seminar is not intended as a substitute for your physician's guidance and care. My name is Sarah Rothschild, the VP of Program Services, and I am your moderator for today. I would like to introduce you to our presenter today, Dr. Peter Reichert. Dr. Peter Reichert is an assistant professor and head of the Department of Oncology and Palliative Care at the Helios Clinicum Berlin Buch in Berlin, Germany, and is director of the Cancer Center Berlin Buch at the Sarcoma Center Berlin, Brandenburg. Dr. Reichert is a co author of the current European Society for Medical Oncology Gu Guidelines for the Management of GIST, Soft Tissue, and Bone Sarcomas, and a member of the ESMO Sarcoma Faculty. He is the chairman of the Scientific Committee of the GIST and Sarcoma Patients Organization, Das Levenhaus, a member of the Medical Board of the Max Foundation, and a member of the LifeRaft Group's Global GIST Advisory Team. Dr. Reichert has contributed to numerous publications on soft tissue sarcoma and GIST management in leading oncology journals. We're very happy to have him today, and Dr. Reichert, you may begin. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, welcome to everybody listening to this um, web seminar. It's my great pleasure, and as I understood, we have a more or less global participation. So, um, good morning, hello, good evening, good night to wherever you are. It's really a great pleasure uh, staying even virtually with all of you. Um, okay, so if we take a second to look at the first slide, I don't know and I can unfortunately not answer you all who may remember this Time magazine front page, but basically that is about the moment where the gist Gleevec story started the overwhelming success, and this was basically a breakthrough in cancer medicine development and from today's perspective, that really changed dramatically how we understand and treat cancers of different types by now. At that time, 2001, GIST was the first solid tumor to be treated by this type of therapy, targeted therapy as we call it since then. By now, many diseases are treated with drugs uh, that are not so different from Gleevec. And as all of you will know, a lot of, or at least a couple of new drugs have been developed uh, for treating GIST patients, and we will discuss many of them during the next um, 45 minutes. If we look at the next slide, that is showing the the summary of the European comparative study looking into the comparison of 400 and 800 milligrams. As you can see, there is no real difference between the two doses. But what, what has been extremely interesting to learn from this study, if we look at the left part, the progression-free survival uh, curve, that is how the patients behave on treatment with imatinib. This shows a rather rapid decline in the first couple of years, which then changes. And if you take a look at the time point, let's say starting eight years after the beginning, so the, the curve above the eight, 10, and 12 figures, this is basically nearly flat and that means that a patient who has been on continuous imatinib treatment for eight years has an extremely low probability of developing a secondary resistance, which means this patient is very likely to remain stable or responding to Gleevec for many more years and that is shown on the right part, the overall survival curve, which is a couple of years behind uh, compared to the progression-free survival curve, but as you can see, also starts getting a flat line at the 10, 12 year time point. And again, this means that if a patient has survived 10 years 
uh, of imatinib GIST therapy with a stable, still responding disease, the likelihood of dying from GIST gets lower than the likelihood of dying due to old age or any possible intercurrent disease or accident or whatsoever. So by that, the metastatic GIST could be transformed in what we would rather call a chronic disease requiring continuous therapy but allows the patient to live with the disease and to live with the treatment. Next slide is showing basically the same results from the, uh, from the US American study. These two studies were conducted completely in parallel, had the identical design and the results, as you can see, are more or less identical. So this repeats the findings from the European study. The next slide is showing the comparison of the two dose levels, 400 and 800. And as you could see on the two previous slides, there was virtually no difference um, in result with these two different doses. However, there is a difference, and this is even a statistically significant difference, if we look at the subgroup of patients with an exon 9 kit mutation. That is a small subgroup uh, in the range of approximately 10%, and these patients do indeed benefit from the higher dose of 800 milligram compared to the standard dose of 400 milligram, and this has generated the standard of care recommendation to treat patients with an underlying KIT exon 9 mutation with 800 milligrams of daily imatinib as tolerated. If it's not tolerated, however, the patients would switch to a lower dose, but if it's tolerated, 800 would be the recommended dose. The next slide shows um, from the Two studies, again, the European EORTC 62005 and the American S0033 study. What happened to patients who were randomized, so treated by chance with a 400 milligram dose, and they did progress on the 400 milligram, they were then allowed to cross over to the higher dose. And as you can see, approximately one-third of the patients responded to the increased dose of 800 milligrams when they had shown progressive disease on 400. Very likely, there are two explanations from the benefit of increased dose. The most important explanation is that those patients who were who did start with 400 milligrams but had an exon 9 mutation, as we know now, but did not know at the time when the trials were conducted, that they do indeed require higher doses. So we would not start such a patient today on 400. I mean, we would start on 400 but escalate very, very rapidly within a few weeks to the uh, required dose of 800. And those starting with 400, of course, do benefit from the uh, increase to 800, which is not, from the understanding, it's not an increase in dose, but it's just reaching the required standard dose. On the other hand, there may be patients who do reach insufficient imatinib blood levels with a given dose, and that is shown on the next slide. Um, this is as you can see, um, already 10 years old, this publication from George Dimitri. And this shows an interesting finding, which is the distribution of imatinib blood levels that can be reached by different doses. And as you see, and this is not necessarily what you may expect, that the dose of 400 milligram in yellow gives very low up to quite high doses and also the dose of 600 in blue can result in low doses and also in high doses. So 
it's not that the blues would be all on the right side, higher levels, and the yellows would be on the left side, lower levels, but it's a very individual thing, so with the same dose, different patients may well have different blood levels, and therefore, if the disease does not respond properly to the imatinib treatment at a given dose, it's reasonable to increase the dose um, in case the patient might require a higher dose to reach a sufficient blood level that his neighbor patient already achieves with a lower dose. So this is individual, and we will come back to the concept of individual doses a little later on. Um, next uh, slide shows the result of insufficient blood level. This is from the same publication from 2009 showing that patients who have an insufficient blood level do have much worse outcome compared to those with a sufficient blood level. And the comparison, and that's quite interesting, is that only those with the lowest blood level do worse whereas those patients who have an, a reasonable blood level, they have the same outcome compared to those who have an even higher blood level. That is the comparison of quartile Q2, Q3, compared to Q4, that's those with the highest blood level. That does not give extra benefit. So the issue is not to reach a maximum blood level, but to maintain a sufficient blood level. So the question is not to give as much as possible, but to avoid insufficient low blood levels. And this also translates in the recommendation that treatment should not be interrupted. So once imatinib therapy or any other drug used in GIST, it has to be taken according to the scheduled recommendations. It's not something you either take or you leave it, and you may take it a week, and the next week you stop it, uh, unless this is recommended by your specific schedule. Uh, that will result in much worse outcome, so you should always stick to the recommended schedule that is discussed with you by your prescribing physician preferably an expert physician because she or he will know about this and somebody not experienced in GIST therapy may well not know this. So it's always best to be treated by somebody who knows what to do when treating a GIST patient. There are obviously differences uh, concerning different drugs. So a continuous dosing without interruption is clearly the standard of care for imatinib. Later on, we will briefly discuss sunitinib and regorafenib, and there we have a different concept of dosing and scheduling, but this will be discussed a little later on. The next slide uh, shows the, the data on the question that has been asked many years ago when the treatment works so well, may we stop after a couple years of therapy and the result may uh, remain good. The disease will be controlled even after stopping the treatment. And the very clear answer here is no. If you stop the treatment, and this has been done in this study after one year, after three years, and after five years, the result is always the same. When you stop treatment, the disease will progress again or there will be a recurrence if the disease has completely gone before. And this has led to the standard of care recommendation that imatinib treatment, and this also applies to any other treatment, any other medication, in further lines, if the treatment works well, you should never stop unless side effects do mandate interruption of treatment. But if that's not the case, the treatment has to be continued as long as it works and helps controlling the disease. No stopping 
um, when the disease is under control. Otherwise, the disease will get out of control and will start coming back or growing again. The next slide briefly addresses the issue of so-called neoadjuvant therapy. That is the concept of treating a localized gist, no metastatic disease, a localized gist prior to surgery. And this is generally recommended in all cases where the surgery may be affected by the preoperative medical therapy. This means if the amount of surgery, whether it's mutilating or not, may be influenced by downsizing the tumor. So if there is a big tumor and the surgeon tells you, in this case, I need to take out the whole rectum or I have to take out the complete stomach, in such a situation, it's absolutely recommended and mandatory to use medical treatment before surgery with the aim of shrinking the tumor to hopefully, possibly allow for less mutilating surgery. So if a, if a tumor would require a total gastrectomy, and the medical therapy shrinks the gist tumor in the stomach dramatically, the final surgical recommendation may be just a removal of a small part of the stomach, and such, a, such an issue has to be discussed in any case. Unfortunately, this is not always the case, and we do see patients every now and then who had um, big surgery without even giving a chance for the tumor to shrink by starting with medical therapy instead of doing surgery upfront. So this is something uh, very important to keep in mind. Um, and at that time, it's again very important to point out that whenever a medical therapy is discussed, it is absolutely mandatory and there is no possible exception. We do have to know the mutational status of the gist. It's not acceptable to start medical therapy in gist without knowing the mutational status, specifically in the adjuvant situation and also in the neoadjuvant situation. If you do not know the mutational status, you may use the wrong dose, you may use the wrong drug, and you may use medication in a resistant mutation where the drug will not work and lose time because if the tumor cannot respond to therapy, then it doesn't make sense to use medical therapy, then you have to go for immediate surgery. So, Keep in mind, before starting medical therapy with whatever drug is used in GIST, the mutational status is mandatory to know. No mutational information, no treatment. That is uh, something that has to be kept in mind. I know or I think that there may be people listening to this who do not have access to mutational uh, testing. That is a big problem, um, and this has to be solved on a country level. It's no problem at all to send a tumor specimen to a laboratory in many places in the world where a mutation testing can be done. It's not very costly today. It has dramatically dropped in cost, so it's absolutely important to do whatever is necessary to get the information on the mutational status of a GIST tumor before considering a specific treatment type. The next slide is 
looking into the question, uh, sometimes surgeons do ask, what about metastatic gist that can possibly be completely resected? So let's assume a patient has a gastric gist and a couple of liver metastases. Some surgeons might argue they can operate the gastric tumor and they can also remove the liver metastases and then the disease, the visible disease is completely gone and they may argue that this could possibly be of advantage to the patient. This is one of the very few um, data that have been published uh, with respect to this question. And as you can see, these two curves are completely overlapping. So whether surgical complete remission before imatinib was reached or the patient had no surgery before imatinib, the outcome is absolutely identical. And this clearly means that the standard of care, and this is given in the first summary slide, the next one, in locally advanced or metastatic GIST, imatinib treatment is the first-line therapy in any case, with the exception of resistance mutations, but in any case where imatinib may work, this is the standard of care. Not surgery in metastatic advanced disease, medical therapy with imatinib is the first line gold standard therapy. The standard dose is 400 milligrams per day with the exception of the small subgroup of exon 9 kit mutated GIST, where we do recommend 800 milligrams per day if tolerated. Again, we do not recommend to start 800 milligram on day one. We normally start with 400 milligrams and escalate the 400 to 800 within a few weeks which makes it much better tolerated than starting 800 on day one. The treatment has to be continued unlimited until the disease does finally progress, which is not always the case. We do have patients who are now approaching year 20 with imatinib treatment, so it may be well unlimited in first line. And as shown, neoadjuvant therapy, preoperative medical treatment, is the standard of care in any case where it at least might affect the surgical amount necessary to remove the tumor. So if it can possibly affect the amount of surgery, it would be considered standard of care but it does again require a mutational analysis to make the appropriate choice of medical therapy. So that is the overview on first-line imatinib therapy in advanced metastatic disease. So here we have the first question we would like to answer uh, to uh, put to everybody and ask you to answer it. What is your routine follow-up imaging? So if you are under therapy or if you are in follow-up after having undergone surgery for GIST, what is the routine follow-up imaging? Either CT or a PET, which would normally be a PET CT, MRI or possibly ultrasound. If you would just vote, we will have the poll in a few seconds. Now please vote.
So let's see when we get the result. Do you see the results on your screen? Not yet. Okay. Um, hopefully everybody else can see the results in front of them. I'm seeing 81% listed CT, 12% PET. 81? Mm -hmm. 81% CT, 12% yep. PET, 18% MRI, and 6% ultrasound. Okay. Well, that is... I would say that is a very nice, reasonable result. So, uh, classically, computed tomography CT is considered the standard of care in basically all guidelines around the world. PET imaging is not recommended as standard of care. In follow-up, there are specific indications, but we would not recommend the use of PET as a standard for routine uh, follow-up imaging. There are exceptions, but it's not considered standard. MRI is a reasonable alternative to computed tomography, especially in cases where you may be concerned about long-term radiation exposure associated with CT, because MRI does not use radiation exposure, as you know, so it's a reasonable alternative if available. Ultrasound is not considered an acceptable alternative. It can be used in selected cases to get an impression because it's easily available. You can just check it out and get a result within a few minutes, but it's not considered standard of care for routine follow-up imaging. So standard of care is CT, MRI is a reasonable alternative with the advantage of avoiding radiation exposure. Okay, thanks for voting. Um, now we move on to the concept of managing progression. So progression seems to be a very straightforward definition. The disease obviously does not respond to treatment anymore. However, it is a rather complex situation and we have to consider a few very basic considerations when facing progression or possible progression. First of all, the question is, is it a real progression? We do see a lot of patients who come with the information the disease would obviously progress, but if we take a second look at the imaging, then we can confirm that this is not a progression, that the, the appearance of the lesions has changed, but we would rather interpret these changes as a positive result of treatment, so it would rather be a response and not a progression. So in several situations, it's necessary to get a confirmation by an experienced radiologist who has seen, I would say, more than one gist um, with, treating, uh, with treatment of imatinib of other drugs. You need to have some experience to interpret the CT or MRI images. We still do see sometimes, very rarely but by now, but we do sometimes see patients where the medication does not work and the explanation is simply that it was a misdiagnosis and it may not be a gist but some other type of sarcoma where you would not expect imatinib or other uh, drugs to work. So in uh, some cases, we do uh, ask a reference histology to confirm or not the GIST diagnosis. Very important is to check the compliance, which simply means if the patient didn't take the medication, then it cannot work, and then it's not a resistance to the medication, but it's simply progression due to not taking the medication. Next question is, 
Does the patient have symptoms that may require immediate action? Very rarely we are facing an emergency situation. And finally, do we have local treatment options or do we need to consider to change the medical therapy? As a general rule, changing treatment in advanced GIST is nearly never, never an emergency situation. So if a patient is seen by a less experienced doctor and the doctor tells the patient, we do need to change the treatment immediately, stop today and start the next treatment today, this may not be the best recommendation. It's never an emergency, so there is always time to ask and answer the questions put on this slide. There should be time to see an expert if the treatment is not supervised by an expert so far. So we always recommend the patients before they change therapy, they should consider to ask an expert whether this is really appropriate or not. Next slide is a focal progression. So you see within this lesion there is growing something and that is the concept of a secondary resistance mutation. This means some of the cells have become resistant to the treatment while others are still responding. In such a situation we can consider local treatment options but we also consider medical treatment changes and the second line standard of care. Next slide. I have to speed up a little bit. Next slide is showing the results of the sunitinib pivotal study showing the efficacy of sunitinib in patients who have failed imatinib treatment, giving an advantage over placebo therapy, and this has established sunitinib as the standard of care in second line. We have done a lot of uh, um, studies looking into the individual dosing of sunitinib because sunitinib does create many more side effects than imatinib. So it's much more important to have a, an individualized side effect management to allow patients to stay on the drug instead of stopping the drug if they do not tolerate the standard recommended dose. That has been shown, next slide, in the largest study undertaken in GIST so far. And if you compare the blue and the yellow lines, you can see there is a very big difference. The blue line is patients, representing patients who have been put on an individual dosing schedule tailored to their individual need in contrast to the yellow curve representing patients who have been put on the standard dosing 50 milligrams four weeks on, two weeks off, and if they do not tolerate the standard st schedule, it is stopped instead of switching to a more individualized dosing schedule. Dramatic difference, and this really leads to the recommendation to use individualized dosing, how much drug per day, how many days on treatment, how many days off treatment, an individualized schedule per patient uh, is what has to be checked out in specially sunitinib and also regorafenib treatment. And if we switch one slide and move on to the following slide, next one, that is, next slide, that is the recommendation for which is the best schedule for sunitinib? Very easy, ask your patient. Now what does it mean, ask your patient? Ask your patient means you need to check the tolerance, the side effects, 
discuss this with the patient and then you can come up with a recommendation how long the patient should take the drug before it's interrupted for a couple of days and this has to be individualized. So you need to sit down with the patient and work out the best possible schedule for this patient. And it may well be different from the schedule of your next and the next and the next patient. It has to be individualized. Next slide is showing that not all drugs are the same and the different resistance mutations we do see in GIST exons 13, 14, and 17, they respond differently to the different drugs. Sunitinib is quite active in secondary resistance mutations in exons 13 and 14, whereas it's not active in secondary mutations in exons 17. Regorafenib as the third line drug, however, is active in exon 17, also 14, but not in exon 13. So whatever drug you use, there is a risk that some of the tumor cells who do have a different resistance mutations will still grow, and therefore these second and third line drugs are working much shorter than imatinib in the first line because over time of several months, normally more resistance is evolving and then we have to change the treatment again. The next slide is showing the activity of regorafenib in the third line setting, again compared to placebo and showing that it's working in patients who have failed imatinib and sunitinib and this has defined Regorafenib as the global standard of care in third line. We skip the next slide, Sarah, move on to the following one. Yes, in case all available therapy has failed, imatinib, sunitinib, regorafenib may be a clinical study. The question is, should all drug be stopped? or is it better to use a drug that has already been used by the patient instead of nothing? And the answer is that it's better to use a drug even if it has failed instead of using nothing. So we do not recommend to stop all drug, but we recommend to use either imatinib, also possibly sunitinib, if it has worked for some time in the previous course of disease instead of giving nothing because it's better to have a little bit of tumor growth, of stopping tumor growth instead of not stopping the tumor growth at all. The next slide is showing the next summary. Second line standard would be sunitinib with an individualized scalar, uh, tailored to the personal needs of the patient dosing. Third line is regorafenib and if no further options are available, it has been shown that the resumption of imatinib is at least a little bit better than using nothing at all. The next few slides uh, I think we have to skip the second poll, Sarah, based on uh, time constraints. So we discuss newer treatment options for the next few minutes. One of the drugs currently under development is called avapritinib. It was formerly called BLU285, now has been called avapritinib. And that drug has fantastic activity in the very rare subset of patients with a PDGF receptor alpha D842V mutation. This mutation is completely resistant to imatinib, sunitinib, and regorafenib. So patients with this mutation did not have any treatment option until some time ago and avapritinib 
was specifically developed for this mutation and does show dramatic response in nearly all patients. The drug is about to uh, be approved by the FDA hopefully in the next couple of months. So all patients with this very rare mutational subtype will then have a possible treatment alternative available. The next slide does show that avabritinib is also, but less, active in refractory GIST in the fourth line. So patients who have been treated with imatinib, sunitinib, and also regorafenib. And the next slide is showing that the activity in third line regorafenib naive patients is again better. So it works in most of the patients. And this has led to the concept of an ongoing randomized clinical study shown in the next slide. It's the phase three Voyager study, which is now enrolling patients in third line who have already failed imatinib and sunitinib. And the randomization one to one is to either avabritinib, the new drug, or regorafenib, the current standard of care in third line. The next slide is showing another study that will probably start by the end of this year, and it's also a phase three study, the COMPASS study, and this will look in an even earlier line, comparing avabritinib to sunitinib in second line, but only looking into patients who have a secondary resistance mutation excluding uh, exon 13, so only involving patients with secondary resistance mutations in exon 14 or 17. The next slide is showing the second drug that is currently under development. It has been called DCC2618 and is now called Rebritinib. This is showing the activity in heavily pre-treated patients, the curve in red, including those patients who have been treated with a sufficient dose. And this is showing that most of the patients have a long-lasting benefit from this treatment. And this was the basis for another trial currently uh, planned and already enrolling, comparing rebritinib, next slide please, to sunitinib in second line treatment. And this does include all patients because rebritinib seems to be active in all types of secondary resistance mutations, not only in specific uh, mutational subtypes, but it seems to be active in all. So this does include all patients who have failed imatinib and are put on either rebritinib or sunitinib as the current standard of care for second line. This leads to the next summary slide. Avabritinib is about to become the gold standard for patients with a D842V mutation. Next slide, please, Sarah. Uh, no, you skipped one. Yes, avabritinib will be the standard of care in D842V patients about to become available after FDA approval. Hopefully, the European agency will follow very soon. Avabritinib and rebritinib Rebritinib, that's a misprint, sorry, are active in fourth line and both drugs are currently studied in clinical trials in earlier lines. And this means that very likely in the next few upcoming years we will see a change in the standard of care uh, with respect to the sequence of treatment lines. Imatinib will clearly remain the gold standard in first line, but it's quite likely 
that we will see a change for the standard defining the second and third line treatment. But this is ongoing clinical investigation. Next couple of slides are showing um, a few local treatment options. Uh, I will do this rather quickly because we're a little bit short of time by now. Chemo embolization or embolization. That means that we use an intra-arterial superselective injection of lipiodol, that's fatty particles that block the blood flow and we either use it alone or we mix it with a standard chemotherapy agent doxorubicin. The next slide is showing an arteriography. Um, so you see the catheter and you see this bunch of vessels and that's the tumor lesion. So if we put the lipiodol plus or minus the chemotherapy in the artery feeding the tumor, uh, then we can block the tumor. It will be blocked off blood supply and therefore the tumor cells will die and the lesion will shrink. The next slide does show the concept um, and you can see that over time the lesion is changing and you see these small white spots um, showing that, the, that there is um, a contrast blocked in the tumor lesion. Um, therefore, um, at least stopping the growth of uh, such a hepatic metastatic lesion. The next slide is showing um, the procedure. So the slide just shown was prior to the embolization, showing the lesion. This is the procedure, which means the radiologist puts in the catheter, makes a picture to check that it's in the right spot, and then injects the material. And the next slide does show the same image from the previous case, and you can see that the lesion is now much smaller uh, because the blood supply has been blocked and the lesion cannot grow again and may eventually shrink over time. Next slide does show um, a study that has been done many years ago in uh, MD Anderson in Houston showing the effect of hepatic artery chemoembolization and you can see that the median time how long this treatment may work is in the range of eight months so that is comparable to let's say second line sunitinib or third line regorafenib which means that this offers an additional treatment option it does not substitute any of the medical treatments, but it offers an additional possibility to treat patients uh, if the technique is applicable based on the individual imaging findings. The next slide is showing another possibility, which is radiofrequency ablation. That's also a localized treatment, a minimal invasive therapy. You put a needle into the lesion and you deliver heat and this will also kill the tumor cells and eventually the lesion will shrink, which is shown in the next slide. Um, give an example. You can see the red arrow on the left side. You see this metastasis in the liver a few centimeters in size and the other picture is showing the same lesion uh, a few months after the radiofrequency ablation again marked by the red arrow and you can see that there is this white spot and this means that this is the former metastasis that has been killed by the heat and is not growing anymore. Basically, there are several 
local treatment options and we do not have a comparison of different methods. So it has to be based on an individual decision which local treatment option works best in an individual patient case based on anatomic considerations, how many lesions, how big are the lesions, where are the lesions, where they are located in the liver, in the central part of the liver, in the peripheral part of the liver. So all of this has been asked and answered and then we can decide on the specific type of local treatment in an individual case. This is summarized on the next and next slide. So we Exactly. So the treatments are surgical resection of a lesion, chemo or chemoembolization, radiofrequency ablation. We also have a technique called selective intraarterial radiation treatment that is comparable to the chemoembolization, but we do not use fatty particles to block the blood supply, but we use small plastic particles that are covered by radioactive parts and therefore they are put in the lesion, they, are, they stay in the lesion, they block the blood supply in the lesion so the lesion gets an internal radiation exposure thereby again killing the tumor cells. And finally you can also use external radiation to treat metastatic lesions in different parts of the body, specifically the liver, and this does also work in the very rare event of bony lesions, bone metastases. The next couple of slides uh, are addressing the adjuvant therapy, and we directly switch to the next this is showing the risk classification system, simply telling you that based on the size of the gist, the mitotic activity, whether there are a lot of dividing cells or only few dividing cells, and the location of the gist, we can estimate the risk of recurrence. This means if the lesion has been taken out by the surgery, is there a big risk for developing metastatic disease or is there a small risk for developing metastatic disease? Based on this, we will recommend an adjuvant therapy, yes or no. The next slide shows another classification system, uh, the so-called contour maps. So here you can also use the location, the mitotic count and the tumor size um, and estimate the risk of recurrence by the respective color ranging from 0 to 100 percent and if there is a significant risk of recurrence we would then recommend the patient adjuvant therapy. Next slide. The standard of care is imatinib given for three years. This is the comparative study comparing three years to only one year, showing a significant benefit also in overall survival. And this study has defined the global standard of care, recommending three years of adjuvant imatinib treatment in patients with a high risk of recurrence after surgical removal of a GIST tumor. We skip the next slide and come to the final summary. Summarizing adjuvant treatment issues, in all cases we require the evaluation of the risk of recurrence. We need to know how likely is the, developing, the development of metastatic disease. If the risk is high, we recommend adjuvant therapy. Again, in this situation, mutational analysis is absolutely mandatory. It's not luxury that some fancy institutions are using. It's mandatory. No mutational analysis results, 
no recommendation for adjuvant therapy, yes or no, possible. You need to know the mutation. Imatinib, 400 milligrams for three years, is the standard of care in just with a significant risk of recurrence. We do recommend absolutely no adjuvant therapy if the risk is low. We do not recommend adjuvant therapy in patients with a PDGF receptor alpha exon 18 D842V mutation type because here imatinib does not work at all and we do not recommend adjuvant therapy in just cases with no mutation in KIT or PDGF receptor alpha, so-called wild-type KIT PDGF receptor alpha GIST tumors. These patients should not receive adjuvant therapy. So that is the final summary slide. Um, Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Reichardt. Yes. Yes, it, yes, this I, is an excellent presentation. I think that um, I hope everybody takes away some major themes that he talked about today, one being mutational testing. And if you have not received mutational testing, um, please contact the LifeRaft group and we can help facilitate getting testing done. Um, the same thing with plasma level testing. So um, please reach out to LifeRaft at liferaftgroup.org for more information. We do have uh, some questions that came in, so let's see if we can squeeze them in at the end. Uh, so the first question is, has there been any research or clinical trials regarding taking less than a daily dose of 400 milligrams of Gleevec? The answer is no. There has been no research, no clinical trials be done. We do know that occasionally patients may benefit from lower doses. The explanation is, as I discussed earlier on, that the blood level is uh, individually uh, different. So there may be patients who have an appropriate blood level with even a lower dose, but that is something difficult to assess. So the recommendation is that 400 milligrams should be the minimal dose taken. We do not advise using lower doses unless severe side effects do not allow 400 milligrams. In such cases, we would try to use the highest possible dose and do close follow-up to monitor whether it's working or not. Okay, thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on generic imatinib and its efficacy among just patients? And just as a side note, um, a lot of our patients do ask about this all around the world as there's different generics um, coming into yeah. the market. So um, I'm sure this question is asked a lot as a clinician. We are Absolutely, in that is a global issue also in our country. Um, so we have to make very clear that the question refers to generic imatinib. A generic drug is produced according to the same quality control issues as the original drug. So you can be 100% sure that a generic imatinib medication does contain imatinib. It may well come from the same facility than the original Gleevec drug, and Novartis itself does have a couple of generic drugs in the market that have a different name but are made in the same factory. And there is absolutely no concern from my side to use a generic imatinib drug. There are, however, a couple of illegal drugs around where we do not know where they do come from, where, whether they are produced according to quality control standards, and we would very strongly recommend not to use these drugs. So a generic from a well-recognized generic drug producer is safe to take, but you need to know whether it's a reliable company 
producing this drug according to the general standards of quality control, then it's safe. If not, you should not take it. Okay, thank you. Uh, for patients with metastatic disease, what are your thoughts about patients who've been on Gleevec for many years who have developed stage 3 and higher chronic kidney disease, but whose tumors are still responding well to Gleevec, even at lower doses secondary to chronic kidney disease? Yeah, that is a very, very difficult issue. We do know that a very small proportion of patients in the range of 1 or 2% do develop chronic kidney failure. And unfortunately, this may well go down to a requirement of chronic hemodialysis. Uh, so that is an existing problem. And the problem is the patients cannot stop therapy because then the gist will grow again. Um, if they continue treatment, the kidney function may well further deteriorate. So the question is, can we safely switch to another treatment with less uh, kidney toxicity? That is not fully answered at the moment. There is a study going on on the rebritinib I have mentioned for refractory disease. Here we do have a study open in a few uh, referral sites where this drug is studied in patients with chronic kidney failure as a possible substitute for imatinib. I know that only few sites are available for this study, but just to mention, there is work going on. Currently, there is no standard recommendation, so in case this is a question, it has to be discussed by a GIST expert to find the best individually possible solution. Excellent. And the last question is, how many scans without tumor shrinkage do you need before operating? The general recommendation is treatment until best response. So best response means there is no further shrinkage, and this is clearly defined by the following image that does not show further shrinkage. So this means if imaging 1, 2, and 3 shows shrinkage, and then you continue therapy, and image number 4 does not show further shrinkage compared to image number 3, then image number 3 shows the best possible response, but it has to be confirmed by the following image. So you continue until the image does, does not show further shrinkage and then you operate. This normally is in the range of six to nine months. It can be longer, it may be shorter, but the general um, duration is in the six to nine months range. Excellent. Well, this concludes the presentation for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Peter Reichart for joining us and everybody who's joined today. The recording will be available shortly, so please stay tuned. And everybody, have a wonderful day.